Well, we are in a sermon series. We are looking at some wonderful, amazing, outstanding women, women out of the Bible. And if you would turn with me into your Old Testament, we're going to be in the book of Joshua. There are some Bibles in the pews beneath you in the blue chairs. Otherwise, if you've got an iPhone, iPad, Android, uh, version works fantastically well. If you don't own a Bible and you're here today on our Welcome Center, there are some blue Bibles as you exit these double doors to the left. Grab one of those blue Bibles and take it home. If there's somebody in your life who doesn't own a Bible, feel free to take one of those to them. I have lots more in my office and I'll keep replenishing them. If I've got to buy more, I'll gladly buy more. So take those Bibles and give them away. They are giveaway Bibles. So we're going to be in Joshua, Joshua 2, in fact, as we continue to look at these faithful women who understood what God's vision was for them and then they followed it. Today's message is the story of Rahab and, and I kind of subtitled it from harlot to heroine. Okay. And, and not the drug heroine to the female hero heroine. Let me get started by asking you a question. How many of you, just how many of you, honestly, have people in your life that you would just rather not spend time with? Right? Yeah? Yeah? Pastor's got those folks. I'm not going to tell you who. But... We, there's, there's, there's people, right? There's just those kind of people in this life, certain people that you don't want to be around, you don't want to necessarily talk to all the time. Uh, let me give you an example, right? How about this? Here's one that I think we can all agree we don't like these people. And it's not usually good to make a blanket statement like that, but I think I can safely say it. How many of you have at least one phone call in the last week from a telemarketer? Does anybody like them? No? All right, okay. See, I can safely say nobody likes telemarketers in this safe place here at church, right? Nobody enjoys spending time on the phone with telemarketers. And, and as I was doing my studies this week for the sermon, I, I ran across this list of some interesting responses that you could have to telemarketers. The first one simply says, just say to them, I'm sorry, but I'm really busy right now. How about you give me your home phone number and I'll call you back while you're having supper and we'll have a conversation about this. Right? Anybody ever feel like doing that while you're eating? Or maybe it's just that I'm always eating. I don't know. I'm a big guy. I can joke about that. The other, the other this was a great one. I liked this one. I got to pull out my cell phone. I got to turn the sound on and see if you can hear it. And they said, uh, here's a way to respond when these telemarketers called. They said, grab your phone out while you're talking to them and turn on the keypad and start playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. Okay? See if I can do it. Here's the numbers. (laughs) Right? Can you hear that? Hopefully I didn't dial somebody in Indonesia there. <laughs> or, or, or here, here's a classic one. When they call and they ask for your spouse or somebody else in the household, you just go, We just don't ever unlock the door and let them out. <laughs> so, no, you can't talk to them, right? Now, they are strangers and we are Christians, so I'm joking about this because these are people who are trying to make their living. And, and while we don't like it, we do actually have to kind of be nice and treat them fairly. But however, the point I'm trying to make is simply this, that there are some people in this world that simply we would just rather not talk to, we'd rather not spend time with, right? Our text in Joshua 2 today describes a woman not very many people would have wanted to spend much time with. If you want to follow along, as I said, we're going to be in Joshua 2 today. And uh, most, mostly there, I'll, I'll reference a few other verses, but if you stick your thumb in there. Joshua 2, verse 1 says this. It says, Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went... And they came into the house of this harlot, whose name was Rahab, and they lodged there. We find Joshua 2, we find them sending some spies to scout out the land. And what do these spies do? They manage to find themselves into a house of ill repute, right? Now, frankly, if I had been a spy for God, 
it would seem to me at least that the last person that I would want to be spending time with is a prostitute, right? But God knew what he was doing. We gain some valuable insight into the story of Rahab as a result of what is said about her in the New Testament. Though Rahab is first introduced to us as a prostitute, I mean, not somebody you'd really uh, expect to be praised in the scriptures, right? However, she is praised. Rahab is twice, in fact, celebrated for her great faith and trust in God. She's listed in that, in that great Old Testament list of kind of like the, the hall of faith, right? It's found in Hebrews 11. Verse 31 says, By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she welcomed the spies in peace. And then she's also described as one whose faith proved itself by good works. James 2.25 says this. It says, In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. And not only that, Rahab, interesting little point, is one of three women listed in the genealogy of Jesus. So she's part of the fam, right? She's family. Matthew 1.5 identifies her as the mother of Boaz, who we talked about when we studied Ruth, right? You guys remember Boaz? The basis for all of these New Testament statements about Rahab rest in this short little recorded segment of Joshua 2. And here's what I want you to understand as we focus in on this story. We will find God often uses people with simple faith to accomplish his great purposes no matter what kind of past that they might have had and no matter how insignificant that they might seem at that moment. See, the the story of Rahab is located at a time where the Israelites were preparing to begin their their military campaign to conquer the Promised Land. The Israelites are camped out on the side of the Jordan River. They're waiting for orders to cross the river and to take possession of the land. Remember, they had been wandering in the desert for 40 long years. They were ready to go get settled. They were ready to take the land finally. But the problem was, as they're standing there on the side of the river and they're looking at the land they're supposed to take, there's a whole bunch of people living on that land. That's a problem. So first, Israel, it's going to have to go and it's going to have to conquer all these cities and all these people before they're going to be able to move in and take control of this land. And the very first of those is is a, a massive fortress of a town, a fortress of a city called Jericho, right? And Jericho is about 15 miles away from where they're camped out there on the Jordan River. And before attacking Joshua, this new leader who had replaced Moses, Moses had died, Joshua needs some new information about things like what are the gates of the city like, right? How big of a military force do they have? What's what's the mood? What's the morale of the people? So Joshua, I think wisely, decides to secretly send two spies to go in so that they can come back and help him plan with some strategy what the next step for the Israelites will be. So the question that immediately comes to mind is, Why in the world did they go into a prostitute's house, right? I mean, at first glance, it would appear that this is the wrong thing to do. However, this situation was a special one, and there were several actually logical reasons that they went to Rahab's house. First, I think this is an important one, men going into a prostitute's house wouldn't have gathered any attention whatsoever, right? Nobody would take note of that. Not only that, but there were likely many other military men who had come and gone over time through there. And if your goal is finding out what's going on in Jericho, Rahab's house is actually a very logical place to go. Another logical reason why they would have gone to Rahab's house is because it was located on the wall of the city. And because of that, it would provide them possibly a way of escape in case they became trapped. Now, however, Perhaps none of these very logical reasons would have been sufficient. Not necessarily the reasons why any of us would have gone there. But maybe the last reason is enough to make you understand. 
why they would have gone into this house of ill repute. Because I believe that they went to Rahab's house because God actually led them there. You see, God had plans for Rahab that no one else could see at that time. As far as the spies were concerned, they needed to gather intelligence. But you see, God was doing something greater. God had directed the spies to Rahab's house because he knew her heart was open to him. And he knew that she would be instrumental in the Israelite victory over the city of Jericho. So the spies, they go to Rahab's place, and they're probably being very cautious, as you would imagine. But, as we see in the story, someone figured out that they were there. And the king is notified. They send warning to the king. Hey, king, we got some spies. Better do something about this. And so immediately they send messengers who demand that Rahab turns the spies over to them. Now, even if Rahab wanted to help them out, you have to imagine she felt intense pressure not to. Because here's why. If, if Rahab is caught hiding the spies, she would be guilty of treason, which is an executable offense. So the king, of course, would have expected that Rahab would do her patriotic duty. And in fact, the king's messengers who come to tell her to turn over these men must have trusted her because they don't even bother going inside of the house to inspect it, right? They take her word when she says, oh, no, guys, they're not here. They're like, oh, okay. And off they walk, right? What kind of soldiers are these guys? And then she promptly sends them, not only does she send them off, she sends them on a wild goose chase. She goes, oh yeah, uh, the, the guys, they, yeah, they were here for a little bit, but, you know, um, they left a little while ago and they, maybe they went down the road or something. You know? She kind of gives them some misdirection. And so the king's men go and gather a search party and they go out and try to find the spies so that they could come back and report to their leader. But I want you to notice something else that's going on that makes matters worse. After the search party leaves, if you're following along in scripture there, notice what the city does. The search party goes out, and then in verse 7 it says this. It says that they locked the gate, right? So the men pursue, pursue, because that's what she told them, they're down the road. So the men pursued down the road to the Jordan, to the fords. And as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, it says they shut the gate. They're, of course, I think I'm, I'm imagining at least, they're trying to keep the spies from sneaking back in, right? She says they're gone. Well, we don't want to let them back in, so we better lock the gates. Well, the problem with that is now our spies are trapped inside. How do you get out? What's Rahab to do? What we need to recognize in the story is the fact that Rahab believes that Jericho is doomed. It wasn't a, a question of whether it would happen, but merely of when. Rahab was placing everything that she had at risk for these two complete strangers. See, these spies weren't from her land. These spies weren't from a people that she had known. How was she to know that these two men would actually help her out in any sort of way? Yet, by hiding them and by aiding them in their escape... Rahab will clearly draw her line of loyalty. If the king of Jericho finds out about what she is doing, it's curtains, right? She'll lose everything, including her life. And yet, Rahab believed that if she didn't side with the Israelites and with their God, that she would definitely lose everything anyhow. And so this leads me to my first point about Rahab. Rahab wasn't trusting in the spies for her salvation. She was trusting in God. Let's look at verses 8 and 9. It says, Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof. She had hidden them up on the roof. And she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. See, I want you to notice first that Rahab believed in the Lord, right? And her faith is actually quite impressive. Look closely at what Rahab actually says there in verse 9. She says, I know that the Lord, she's not a Jew, 
But she says, I know that Yahweh God has given you the land. She spoke of Israel taking over the land in the present tense, right? As if it was already done. Even though they had not yet crossed the Jordan River or invaded. In spite of the fact that she could not have been a believer for very long, from what she says, God is already at work in her heart. She was already aware of God and his mighty power. You see, God had had, had brought these spies there not just for their benefit, but also for hers. I like the way the author uh, by the name of John Eldridge puts it. He says, God brings moments of crisis into our lives to halt our business as usual attitude and makes us stop and look at him. You see, the the Lord has planned these God moments so that we will turn to him and respond in faith. That's exactly what Rahab did. She hid those men at the risk of her very own neck. And she decided to go with this God moment. It was her hope that if she could somehow come under Yahweh God's people's protection, that she would then hopefully escape the coming destruction of Jericho. See, Rahab could have turned the spies over and turned them in at any point in time and then benefited from whatever reward would have been given, right? You turn in a bunch of spies, probably going to get some reward from the king. She could have done that, but she doesn't. She could have discounted the, the many stories that she might have heard about the Israelites and their God, but Rahab did not base her faith on who she was, a woman of Jericho, a prostitute, or even on who the spies were. Rahab based her faith on who God is, the God who keeps his promises, the God who protects and saves his people. Rahab willingly surrendered everything that she had to God's mercy. And this is exactly why Rahab's faith was so honored later in the New Testament. For it's this kind of faith that moves the heart of God. When a person willingly trusts God with their entire life, not trying to control it themselves, then God is pleased. And then God will reward that faith and trust with tremendous fruit. How many of you are are like Rahab, willing to trust God with each and every aspect of your life, realizing that God is the God who keeps his promises and will Save his people. Here's the second point to be made about Rahab. Rahab based her faith on who God is. He keeps his promises. Verses 10 and 11 says this. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water from the Red Sea before you. Let me try that again. How the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted, right? And no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. Notice, Rahab didn't actually witness any of the miracles that God had performed. She'd only heard about them, right? Yet, she was willing to trust in him. Everything that Rahab had heard was reinforced the fact that that this God of the Israelites does what he says he's going to do. And this is another reason why her faith was celebrated in the scriptures. She trusted in God, basing her trust in the fact that God had done what he said he was going to do. How about you? Do you likewise trust God? Do you trust that God will do what he says he will do? It's the same God today, folks. Here's a third point about Rahab. And it's one that we really probably need to apply to our lives today. Rahab's faith led her to action. James 2.25, 
as I mentioned, it says this. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and then sent them out by another way? You see, Rahab's faith stands out because it motivated her to actually do something, right? What did she do? She hid the spies. Joshua 2, 4 through 6 says this. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, yes, the two men came to me, but I didn't know where they were from. Verse 5. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark and the men went out. I don't know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, she says, for you will surely overtake them, right? But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flack, which she had laid in order on the roof. Devious, right? Rahab takes further action and makes an agreement with the spies that would be the salvation of her whole family and not just herself. Despite not having this great long history of faith, she was active in living out what she believed. We see that here. What happens in this story and and, and the way that, that God works in and through Rahab illustrates a very important spiritual principle. And this is the last point I want to make about the story of Rahab. And the principle is this. This is a big one. Your past doesn't determine your future. Your choices do. Every single day of our lives, we make choices. And as we reflect upon our past, some of the choices that we have all made are not good ones, right? But we can choose to change and make new choices. And that is exactly what Rahab did. Her choices allowed her to receive many blessings. And not only that, she became a blessing to the entire nation of Israel. Not only did Rahab survive the battle of Jericho, she goes on and becomes a member of the Israelite community and ends up landing in the genealogy of Jesus. And here's the point. Regardless of your past, God wants to use you in the future and you can choose to serve and follow him regardless of whatever happened before. You can choose to serve and follow him starting now. Are there things in your past that have convinced you that God couldn't use someone like you? Please hear me. If God could use Rahab, a prostitute, if God could use Rahab, he can use you and me, folks. The possibilities of the future don't rest on us being worthy. They rest on the fact that God loves us in spite of our failures. Rahab was a prostitute. She was, just like each and every one of us, a sinner. But hear me on this. Despite that, God honored Rahab anyhow. Why? Because Rahab heard about the power of God And she believed in the power of God. And she acted on the things that she had heard. The same God is true today. Whatever your past, it does not dictate your future. Today, you can make new choices. Today, you can choose to move forward in a new way, in a new direction that you've never gone before, regardless of of who you were when you crawled out of bed this morning. God loves you. He's just waiting for you. Amen. Let's pray.